Okay, so we're going to do comprehensive overview for examination one. Um, so this is going to be a mashup of everything that we have learned collectively um, through our PowerPoint slides, through our reading material and our syllabus, uh, through the lecture that we've had briefly, uh, through the supplemental slides we have, and through the lecture series that I do um, on the channel. So take really close notes here. This is going to be, like I said, uh, a brief synopsis of everything that we've covered. I'm going to do it very fast. Thursday is going to be our, uh, our meeting, and we're going to do it between 9.30 and 11. I will send my Zoom link so that we can do an open Zoom. That's p.m., not a.m., so that everyone has an opportunity. And like I said, sit back get a coffee get a tea whatever listen pay attention to the words that are coming out of my mouth don't overcomplicate it and take copious notes okay let's get started all right so i'm going to give you some types of health assessment examples so a screening assessment a good example of that would be a health fair uh, that provides cholesterol and blood pressure checks um, we do that often usually on a annual basis if it's uh, with a uh, specific subgroup or specific hospital network. They usually do it annually or biannually. Um, a comprehensive assessment is your first assessment as a clinician with this new patient. So it is a full head to toe, uh, history and present, the whole shebang bang That's your comprehensive assessment. Like this is your comprehensive uh, review and overview of, for the examination, same deal. Uh, your problem-based or focused assessment is assessing the vitals who reports a change, like difficulty breathing, uh, like feeling hot and sweaty, and you check their blood sugar and realize that it's, you know, 600, those type of deals. That would be a problem-based or what they call a focused assessment. Super important that you guys know that one. Um, a follow-up assessment is going to usually be a return to uh, checking a baseline model. So if I was discharged from a hospital, my follow-up assessment would be post-discharge, um, to which I would hopefully be in better condition, if not baseline condition. So please understand the definitions and the examples of all four. Um, there is going to be a, probably a, a moment where I ask you to decipher between these options of health assessments and you need to tell me which one uh, that is specifically. So when we talk about data analysis, interpretation, development of problem lists, we need to understand that a data analysis is going to be a, a cumulative, or cumulative, sorry, a cumulative mashup of subjective data, objective data, um, and any other information in between. Okay. So what we would do is when we're doing data analysis, we're going to cluster all of the data together versus just having separate forms of data aka subjective data over here, objective data over here. Um, we would uh, make a collective to bring the data together so that the nurse can organize or cluster um, the data so that we can see how the full uh, mock-up of this patient's level of care, patient's needs, uh, patient's baseline, et cetera, et cetera, what that all looks like from a bird's eye view. So please understand, it's not singular, it is a collective when we are talking about clustering data, and that is the best type of data that we can get, um, is clustered data. Now, if you guys remember, I told you in the first lecture that primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention are a huge deal, but objective and subjective data are a huge deal, and I'm not joking with you, this is a thing. So first exam, always going to be a thing. Uh, primary prevention, it is making sure that we are intervening before health effects occur, right? Because of risky behaviors that we do, because of te terrible lifestyles we keep, yada, yada, yada. So examples of primary prevention is exercising three times a week. I didn't say I was sick. I didn't say I had a reoccurring disease process or a chronic disease process. I'm just saying I'm exercising three times per week because I am trying to prevent myself from heart disease. 
Following a healthy, balanced diet, I'm trying to prevent myself from getting diabetes. I don't have diabetes. I don't have any sign of it. My A1C isn't elevated. However, comma, um, I am trying to eat a healthy, balanced diet so that I never have to worry about this problem or receiving yearly influenza immunizations or any other vaccinations uh, for that case for preventative um, preventative method is going to be a method of primary prevention. Please understand that. All right, cool. Secondary prevention. It's pretty easy as well. So it, the screening is done to identify a disease in the earliest stages. Please understand earliest stages means we have this disease process in some form. Can it be retroactivated? In other words, is it reversible? Yes. In this case with secondary prevention, I should be able to turn it around. Prime example, I have type 2 diabetes because my BMI is 30. All right, drop it down to 24 and you won't have diabetes type 2 anymore. Done deal, problem solved. Now, this isn't when we have organ damage. Let me explain. If I have pancreatic damage, that means I'm going to need insulin for the rest of my life to fix this problem. That is do not collect go, do not, do not, you know, uh, collect $200, sorry. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. Um, because you are caught up in a predicament where you are at this point tertiary because that is a permanent problem. Now, if I need to have, uh, I have elevated blood sugar and I need to take uh, a glucophage derivative um, and I'm taking oral insulin derivative, that is different, okay? Because if I lose the weight, I won't have to take it anymore. Problem solved, right? So if signs begin, they are reversible. That is the difference between secondary versus tertiary versus primary. So much like the number one, two, three, what's in the middle is the number two. And in the middle of that is a little bit to the left and a little bit potentially to the right, but nothing is definite. All right, so please understand because people always get those mixed up. So examples, completing a monthly breast self-examination. I'm over 40, I carry the risk, I'm walking the line, so I'm doing preventative so that I can see if it's gonna be a thing, right? Undergoing annual mammography, same concept, all right? Um, a client with a history of heart attacks, taking a low dose aspirin to prevent further heart attacks. Okay, well, they had a disease process, Molly. Yes, yes, they did. They had a heart attack. They had a myocardial infarct. That is different. Let me explain why. If I have a heart attack and then the heart attack is gone, I'm back to baseline, theoretically. There's a lot of fighting in between and I understand what you're getting at if you're gonna get there. For those who have done the research on heart attacks and what that means as far as a quote unquote uh, irreversible condition because there are heart failure components. But in the case of just the heart attack and not reading into the question, taking a low dose aspirin to prevent a secondary heart attack, which means we're back at baseline, which means we're over hanging out into the primary prevention line of life. Then at that point that is considered secondary modality. Okay. Not tertiary. If I have congestive heart failure with a history of heart attacks, that would then become a tertiary problem, which we're about to explain right now. All right, tertiary problems target both the clinical outcome stages of the disease. Um, it is meant to reduce the severity of the disease as well as any sequelae. And sequelae is going to be any other complications as a result of. That's what sequelae means. So basically, in, in the last slide, we had a congestive heart failure patient and congestive heart failure is never going to get better. It's always going to be congestive heart failure. It's always going to be a bummer. But what we're trying to do is to prevent overinflation of, or over, over accumulation of lung fluids in the lungs so that you don't have that backup and you're not blowing, um, you know, blowing bubbles in the hallway is what I call it. it the, the sound of audible congestive heart failure from a hallway sounds like a kid blowing into their chocolate milk with a straw. It's really that loud. So that would be considered tertiary or having a, a dialysis patient who is adhering to their sodium requirements, who's adhering to their potassium requirements, because those are going to keep them out of dialysis so much. And if they do need dialysis frequently, because it's just that bad, um, it would make their life and quality of life better for longer, theoretically. Um, so those would be tertiary preventative methods, okay? 
So those, those types of deals. I hope I made that clear. If you have any questions, just send me a text. It's no big deal. I'll clarify for you. All right, we are back onto objective and subjective data again. I told you we're going to keep hitting it over and over and over until it drives you crazy, and that's cool. So objective data is observed. It is assessed by the nurse, or it is collective data that I can see from laboratory testing. I am a nursing professional. If I see you do something uh, that is um, silly, can I create subjective data? Yes. Because if I say that the person is walking, you know, crooked like they're drunk, that is subjective information. I don't know why they're dry, while they're walking crooked. They could have, I don't know, a cochlear nerve eight, cranial nerve eight uh, deficiency of the vestibular cochlear nerve, and they're out of balance, right? But because I have thrown in my two cents of what I think it is, that becomes subjective data. Now, if I say patient is staggering, that is objective data. I am visualizing a patient staggering. That is collective data. Please understand. So client's blood pressure this morning is 110 over 78. Objective. Client's skin is pale and dusky. I'm visualizing that. I'm a nursing professional. I know what pale and dusky means. Done. Um, client's current temperature is 101.6 degrees. Again, it is collective data that is hard data that is irrefutable data because it has been either obtained through a nursing professional, medical professional, imaging, laboratory testing, et cetera, et cetera. So that's objective. Now let's move on to subjective in the next slide. All right, so very quickly, subjective data is stated, related, or relayed by the client or the family. So I can't feel my toes. Uh, I never get enough sleep. I've been having pain in my arm. Um, I, I have lost 19 pounds in the last four months when I've actually gained 68, uh, per our objective data, which tells us otherwise, um, things of that nature are considered subjective. So if it comes in quotations and it comes from the client or the patient or the family, just go ahead and, and consider it as subjective data, uh, automatically. And then the rest is objective. If you want to look at it that way. So when we're looking at phases of an interview, there's three uh, phases I want to talk to you about. I want to talk about the introduction phase. Um, when you are in an introduction phase, it is a way of understanding what a person is experiencing. So uh, in this interview, you say, you know, tell me a little bit about what's going on with you. Tell me about what's happening to you. I'm trying to understand where you're coming from. I'm trying to understand what you're experiencing. Okay. So that would be the beginning. Then we do what's called a symptom analysis. Um, so we ask them, what kind of pain do you have? How often are you having this pain? What relieves the pain that you're having? Can you describe the pain to me, right? The old cart. Um, so we talk about location and uh, descriptor of the pain, relieving factors, you know, things that make it better, things that make it worse, things we've tried in the past, yada, yada. That's symptom analysis. That's trying to figure out what it is that you've done, honing in the symptoms themselves to create a big picture of what's really going on with you from the inside. And then we have a summary statement, okay? Um, these are opportunities for us to probe into more information without um, delving so far that we act like we already know what's going on. So a common example of this is, I heard you said that you're having pain all over your body. And that's the part where they go, yeah, I have pain all over my body. And then you go, okay, continue and tell me about that or whatever that looks like, right? We're giving them open-ended opportunity, which we're gonna talk about here in a second, to give all of that information out to us. And that would be considered a summary statement because I am summarizing what you have stated to try to probe to get more information. So please understand the difference in the three as well as the examples that go along with it because if you understand the examples, you understand the concept uh, of the framework itself. All right, so human trafficking and domestic violence is a huge, huge, Nikola Tesla love things in three, huge deal to me. It is everything, okay? So that is why I include it in our examination and I include it uh, pretty heavily when we do lecture. 
Um, so far, we've only had one lecture because, you know, orientation, da 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 da. However, in this case, it's a huge, huge thing. So I want you to pay close attention. And I'll explain to you guys why um, on a personal level. I'm not going to do it on YouTube, right? But we'll get there and you guys will learn a little bit more about me. And again, we're going to create this bond and rapport that we have with each other as your academic coach and your nursing life mentor <laughs> for however long it takes um, or however long you keep in contact. So we need to practice the art of permission giving. Permission giving is I'm giving you permission to be open and honest with me as an individual. And I do permission giving by way of expressing things about my life to you guys, right? Now, a lot of teachers say, you got to stop keeping it personal. You can't do, get too close to students. Just like when I was in nursing, they used to say, you can't get close to patients. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, right? You have to get close to people if you expect people to trust you implicitly. Otherwise, they're always going to have the stank eye on you and no one's going to trust you. And they're not going to be like, that person's in my corner no matter what. I am that person for you. Therefore, I have to show you trust by playing the game of permission giving. Permission giving is when I look at you and I ask you a question about something that undoubtedly is going on. And I say, look, I know what you've been through. I've experienced this uh, myself, right? So I always tell people, hey, I'm, you know, I, I'm in this position right now because I've experienced this in the past. What can I do to help you? I, I know what you've been through. And you guys know the things that I have told you about me personally. And I, it doesn't bother me. Like, I'm happy to do it so that we can have this rapport together. It's, it's everything, our bond that we have together, right? Uh, being in, in academia is number two, in my opinion. Having this personal relationship so that we can continue to thrive together as a team, which is what this is and what this should be. That is everything. That's that's more important than anything. So what do we do in the case of human trafficking or domestic violence? Because we're walking in some pretty gray, soggy, muddy areas. And what we say um, is are things like, hey, listen, I've, I've seen women who've been hurt by their husbands before. Um, does anyone hit you, right? And shut your mouth and wait because they're gonna do a couple of things to indicate to you whether this is in their radar or not. So they're either gonna say, absolutely not. They're gonna look you dead in the eyes. Cool. Um, and then you know you're fine. And then you go, do you feel safe at home? And they go, yeah, for sure. They should feel unsafe. They usually throw a joke in. And then you're like, all right, cool. Uncomfortable moment gone, move on. So other things that we need to discuss um, is the lack of uh, making eye contact, um, trying to avoid the question, um, looking over at somebody else for them to answer for you, uh, because that's just the expectation that you have, not having a physical address. Um, weird, strange things that unless you've experienced uh, human trafficking or domestic violence or a derivative, because there are derivatives in between, I assure you, um, you would never know what that looks like. So we're going to talk a lot about human trafficking and domestic violence throughout the entire course because it is a big, huge, ridiculously big deal to me. And we see it more often than we think. Um, unfortunately, doing what I do for as long as I've done, uh, it's at least once or twice a month um, that we have someone down in the emergency department who is a teenager, uh, who is a teenager. How about that? And I'm sure you can put the rest together and it happens often. And if it's not that it's domestic violence, we have a lot of domestic violence, believe it or not in academia, right? Um, a lot of our students go through, uh, domestic violence and that's why they're in nursing because they know what it is to be nothing for themselves and everyone to everyone else because they don't matter and some of you know what i'm talking about right now and i'm sorry if that bothers you but i need for you to know that the gift in disguise is you're doing this nursing program because a piece of you is trying to get out and i'm proud of you for that and i know that and eventually you will get out and i don't know if it's going to be today or tomorrow or the next day but you're going to be so strong after you finish this friends so strong that you're never going to want to deal with that ever again and you're going to fight your way out and it starts today so 
For those of you who I've triggered, I'm sorry. You need to hear it. I need to know that whoever that was for, that was coming from the big people that don't include me. So whatever your creator is, I call it the universe, right? Because that way it kind of gives everybody a hug. So there. Reiterating my point, we need to be very careful when we speak to these people. So we need to give them permission giving techniques, which is, hey, listen, I see a lot of people who get hurt by their spouse or their partner. Um, are you having any trouble with that? Does anybody hit you? And if you keep it in that tone, no one's going to have any hard feelings. I promise you. I've been doing this a long time. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Sorry for the ones I bummed out. Okay, you just needed to hear it. And I love you and I'm proud of you. And it's going to be okay. All right, next slide. All right, so other modes of therapeutic communication and techniques are going to be reflective technique. So reflective technique is when we give um, someone a little bit more time to process to make sure what they're telling me is truly appropriate, especially if it's a weird number, right? So the average person consumes 2,000 calories a day, all right? So let's say I'm asking a patient, you know, how's your diet? And they come back to me and they say, I eat 1,500 calories a day. I would reply automatically, did I understand that you just said you ate 1,500 calories a day? Because at that point when I say that, the tone I'm taking and the way I'm framing that question implies you might want to think about that again, okay, friend? And then they pause and they give me the answer. Um, and usually it's different because they, at that point, are really, really thinking about it and they're cracking it down for every little bit and bolt. And they go, actually, eh, it's probably like 1900 calories. And then I go, okay, no big deal. All right. So please understand that the reflective technique, the examples of the reflective technique and why we have the reflective technique. What is it supposed to do? These are the types of things I need for you to pay attention to. All right. Next slide. Now, we've talked about open-ended questions earlier, a couple of slides back, so we're just going to go over it again because this is the most appropriate uh, question that we use the most often, or the question that we use most often. So, um, patient, they say, I'm feeling pretty down lately. Now, if we use the closed-ended question, we would say, do you feel really down or do you feel depressed? And that's going to give us a yes or a no. Sometimes it may be. But the better way that we can respond is to say, huh, tell me more about that. Now, the huh is important in this, okay? I know you think I'm crazy, but that's cool. You wouldn't be the first one. I'm actually the polar opposite, I promise you. So um, what you would say is, huh, like you look kind of up in the air. You look halfway shocked. You look halfway perplexed. You look like, hmm, there's an enigma behind that. Uh, tell me more about that. You know, maybe throw, maybe throw your hand out. Maybe give a hand gesture. Maybe lean back into your chair a little bit and throw your elbow up into the sky, right? Um, so that we can articulate that we're we're truly curious about this. Now, there's a lot in body motion and body movement uh, when we're talking about things like forensic psychology, which is a huge deal to me. Um, that's very important because the mannerisms with which we keep are nearly, if not more, important than the words we actually speak, right? Because intentions create actions, and actions are from appropriate intentions. And words and actions are, to me, like oil and water. You can tell me until the cows come home what you're going to do, but if you don't do it, I don't care. Your words mean nothing to me, personally. That's because I don't believe that. People are very manipulative. They always have been since the dawn of time, which is why we have war and death and hate and all the isms that I can't stand. So for that reason, it being human nature to be like this, um, I want to make sure that the rest of it is also concomitant with that statement that you've made. All right. So everyone makes fun and says, you know, I'm like a cyborg. I'm like half robot because I'm beep, boop, beep, boop. And I read a lot and I pay attention to a lot of things and I kind of see the world in a different way. That's the joy of autism spectrum. It also gives me the advantage because I see things from a different perspective that you guys normally wouldn't think about who are what we call neurotypical, which isn't a big deal. It just means I'm wired different and you're wired like average population. And that's a beautiful thing for a lot of different reasons. You teach me how to be normal and I teach you how to look outside the box and somewhere we meet in the middle and it, or we meet in the middle, we meet in the middle and it's kind of amazing. So I'm, I'm proud to be what I am and I'm proud to give you my perspective and I'm proud to know that you listen to my perspective and I thank you. So when we get back into the idea of open-ended, 
We're going to say, tell me more about that. We're going to throw our shoulder back. We're going to look, we're going to raise our eyebrows. We're going to genuinely look curious for them because if I just say, oh, tell me more about that and I keep the monotone, I have nothing that's showing them any indicator of anything. They're going to give me a generalized answer just to shut me up because you can tell the difference in, in interest and in, in, dare I say passion behind the words and the actions that I'm creating um, through audible speech and gesture. Uh, so make sure that you are paying attention to your body mechanics as well as the words that are coming out of your mouth. Um, like I said, I kind of am meticulous and uh, break things apart really quick, like uh, something that, uh, I don't know, gets struck by lightning and cracks it together into little microcosms and atoms, right? And then I just kind of grab it and squish it in a ball and put the big picture back together. So... Make sure that you're speaking with your body and with your voice um, so that we can get an appropriate answer. Okay, I've spent four minutes on this. I'm going to move on to the next slide. All right, the time is 6.09. I have class at 6.30. I am at slide 13. This is going to be a speed run, and it's going to be beautiful, and we're going to do it. So I'm going to keep going. Um, symptom analysis technique and therapeutic communication. Um, this is going to probe to get more information or hard data from the patient, okay? We, we spend the time to jog their memory, if you will. So in this example, um, they're going to say, I've been feeling bad lately. I've been having constant headaches for the past few days. My first response, oh, uh, what other symptoms have you noticed, right? Again, I changed the way I influx my voice, especially at the end. I posed it to a question. The word noticed wasn't noticed. It was noticed right? Pay attention to the way you project yourself to other people. It's going to mean the difference between you being a successful individual in this lifetime or a very unsuccessful individual. I don't care if you have a college degree or not. I don't care if you got multiple college degrees or not. If you cannot communicate with people in the human condition and carbon-based life forms, you are going to fail and fail miserably, all right? I'm teaching you how to do these things. Please listen. There are some people who struggle like I do, and I've taken cognitive behavioral therapy. I've, I've, I've done the, you know, forensic psychology. I've, I've studied social justice. Like I do these things, not because it's interesting to me. It's interesting to me because I have a deficit in these areas. So I want to be a subject matter expert so that I can be as quote unquote normal, um, so that I can work with neurotypical people and we can have a cohesive space together in each other's hearts because I know that I have, you know, issue and I need to meet in the middle. So I challenge you to do the same for yourself, right? Everyone can learn something from somebody else. It doesn't matter who you are or what you have. So what other symptoms have you noticed, right? That is going to open up a pathway for them to let me know, oh, yeah, I, I've also had blurred vision. Okay, my brain's thinking hypertension. Boom, right there. Like, done deal. I need to go take a blood pressure right this second. Do you see how that works? So the idea of symptom analysis technique as part of your therapeutic communication techniques is going to jog the memory of the patient so that they can probe and give us more data. All right, next slide. All right, documentation of data. This is gonna take 30 seconds. Complete, accurate, descriptive documentation. It approves the plan of care, prevents the patient from um, having to provide the same information over and over and over, which irritates them to no end of the world, I promise you. So the most important part of the documentation process is it must be accurate, not accurate the vehicle, accurate as in it is correct. And that is all I'm going to say about the slide, 32 seconds later. So jumping back into recognizing victims of domestic violence and human trafficking. I mentioned a couple of them earlier. These are um, some of the many responses that we get. Um, unable to provide address because you move so frequently. Um, unsure of your present location, the date or the time because you're couch hopping, right? Because you have nowhere to go. Accompanied by a person who answers for the patient. Um, interprets for the patient, refuses to let the patient have privacy, things of this nature. This is the one that bothers me the most of all of them. Like I said, this is a very personal situation. This one, uh, if you see this, dead indicator, you have a problem. And you hear the anger in my voice, and I say this because 
I, like I said earlier, you know, I'm, I'm, ne I'm Gen X, right? We don't have triggers. That's not a thing for us. Um, but really it is because I could feel myself getting angry or just, just saying that sentence out loud, uh, because it happens that often. So that's a dead giveaway and you need to go alert somebody like social work immediately, not in possession of personal identification documents or money, right? This is a classic sign of them being homeless, right? If I have a person who doesn't have any family, who's young, who's expendable, I take them. After I take them, because they're expendable, because they mean nothing to me, then I take all of their identification identifiers so that that way they have to pay attention to me. They have to live and die by me. I put my finger up under them, my thumb up under them, and I hold them down by their forehead. Okay? That is what this means. It's quite terrible. Uh, provides an inconsistent or scripted history. If you can't tell me that, you know, you fell and you've got multiple contusions on you that are in this form or shape of a handprint, really, honey? Uh, but they do. They're terrified. They're terrified. They're so afraid of whoever it is that is taken from them that they will say whatever they can to get out of there because you mean in their convoluted way of thinking, which is very flawed, but you know what? It's real to them, so it's real, period. That you are going to anger them and make them hurt you more. And that's gonna happen, it really will. They're gonna get angry and then they're gonna take it out on you more. And then you have to be punished more. And it's all about just relief of the pain for the day. Please understand this is how the mindset works. It's very sad. Unwilling or hesitant to answer questions about injury, displays evidence of controlling or dominating relationships, this would be the partner, demonstrates fear, nervous behavior, or avoids eye contact. Now, you'll notice I don't have eye contact very much. It has nothing to do with domestic violence or human trafficking. That is because of the autism spectrum disorder, right? I have worked on that a lot, but it's still a thing. So if I ever get lost in words, I actually look down because I'm actually not looking down. I'm kind of spacing out, if you will, and going into my brain um, and into my box so that I can collectively find the words that I need to complete my sentence. All right. So it's not that I'm not trying to make eye contact with you. It's not that at all, because I do respect each and every one of you. It's because I'm trying to find the perfect words for you that are going to perfectly articulate what I need to establish and to state in your way of thinking by your way of learning because I have learned each and every one of you and what makes you understand information the best way. So when I see Susie or Sally, I go, Sally, she is a, a spatial learner or she's a kinesthetic learner. So I need to approach her this way. And what are the words that I need to give her really quick? And then I look down and I don't make eye contact. I'm boxing myself in so I can find those words. This is completely different from someone who avoids eye contact altogether because I'm terrified to even look at you because I'm so scared of what's happening. So please understand the difference in the two. I think I've said enough. I think I made my piece. I told you guys and warned you this slide when we're talking about human trafficking and domestic violence, it is everything. So I'm going to hit it and I'm going to hit it hard and I'm going to hit it for um, a, a fair amount of time because it, it's something we don't talk about often enough and it's something that happens often too much. So, all right, next slide. All right, core examination skills of the nursing process. Inspecting skin, you have to. Inspect external eyes. Auscultate heart sounds, right? These are important pieces that we're gonna have to have. What are some things that aren't so important? Um, inspecting in between the toes. It's part of inspecting skin, sure, but is it a core assessment in our nursing assessment? Eh, it is a secondary assessment of our examination skills, right? Because not everyone's diabetic. So I would inspe inspect the color. I would look for lesions all over the body. I would do the, the bigger pieces. And then if I find out they're a diabetic, then I'm going in between the toes to see if there's any uh, ulcerations in between. But until I get that information, I'm going to stick with my cores. And my cores, again, inspecting skin, inspecting external eyes, auscultating heart sounds, all of the things that you would do that are normal things that you would do, regardless of what your patient is. It's like the universal for everyone. All right, so clinical judgment. A uh, nurse's clinical judgment depends on accurate collection of assessment data, but the interpretation of the data guides the nursing action. So the interpretation of the data is the most important piece of that puzzle because I need to have accurate collective data 
but I need to interpret it appropriately as well. Please understand that interpretation of the data guides the nursing actions. It's going to guide what I'm going to do for the rest of the time in the hospital. Um, according to Tanner, clinical judgment uh, is influenced more by the nurse's experiences, knowledge, attitudes, and perspectives than the data. Because I can give you hard data and say the patient has uh, an elevated temperature of 100.2. And then I can tell you that the patient is sweaty, right? But if I don't have the knowledge, the attitudes and perspectives and the experience to know that the reason that they're hot and they're sweaty is because they're an alcoholic and they're going through withdrawal, versus um, they have an infection, then basically my information is, it's nothing, right? It's just collected data. So the nurse's experiences, knowledge and attitudes and perspectives are going to sway that data alone and sway it into a direction in which we can find a conclusive uh, plan for that patient so that we can get them back to baseline as soon as possible. All right, so interview settings. Interview settings, they gotta be comfortable, right? If I'm about to get into, you know, 20 minutes of collective data information and I'm sitting next to a computer, I don't want my patient shivering or sweating bullets because it's too hot or too cold. Do you think they're gonna answer me right? No, they're gonna give me the shortest answer possible so they can get the heck out of the room because they're having a panic attack because they feel like it's 4,000 degrees or they're so chilly that they're shaking and they just don't even care because their teeth are chattering. So if you see these things, adjust the temperature I know that sounds groundbreaking adjust the temperature make it comfortable express your attention and interest through verbal and nonverbal behaviors just like I talked about before it establishes a positive rapport you have to express attention and interest or they're just gonna not say anything at all I think I've covered this slide so we'll move on to the next one all right, so very quickly, interviewing clients of varying age, language, cultures, and genders, we need to interact with each individual person as a unique person. I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what culture you come from. I don't care what gender you are. I don't care what varying age gap you belong to. The problem with putting someone in a box is a box doesn't exist to begin with. We create boxes that never existed to begin with. The idea of race, historically, was actually brought together by a scientist right? Who needed to box things in to prove that they were the superior scientist. And they used the idea of race to show that the race of one scientist versus the race of another scientist determined who was the superior of the two. I cannot make these things up. If you don't believe me, I can show you the Harvard article that I learned in the class a couple of weeks ago. Like, it's not a thing. We create things to compartmentalize people into isms or classes that aren't even a class because we're all human beings and we should be treated uniquely as that unique human being who is like no other human being in this entire world. That is the only thing that this slide says. Don't stereotype. Don't expect that because somebody looks like something, they're going to be something. Some of us have are multiracial and you can't tell i hate the word presenting as because that drives me bananas because you don't present as anything because the idea of collective race is nothing more than the idea of distribution of power to somebody race is an environmental factor believe it or not it is the construct of us living in a geographical location and based off of what our body came out to be and based off of our dna if we have curly hair that means we come historically our ancestors do from an area where genetically you needed to have curly hair because the environment around you meant that you were going to be very chilly and that curly hair acts as an insulator this isn't the idea of a boxed in quote unquote race. We have unnecessary isms because there's unnecessary isms that we've created within our own social constructs and it's disgusting and it's terrible and I hate it. So we need to make sure that everybody is their own person in your brain. If you have it rewired any other type of way, please spend this time in college to unwire yourself and rewire yourself to not feel that a person is anything other than what they say they are and their own conceptual framework and mind frame. Because who am I to tell you who you are? I'm nobody, right? Oh, but you're a doctor. Yeah, great, right? And dentist or dentist, what's your point? 
right? And uh, people who, you know, give elephants food and water and shelter and house them because they're zookeepers, they're zookeepers and nothing more, nothing less. So what's your point, right? I am no different than anybody else. I am what I say I am, like Popeye the Sailor Man, right? I am what I am and that's all that I am. So this is how we need to look at our patients. We need to stop stereotyping. We need to stop playing games. I'm kind of sick of it. COVID really helped us out a lot because when we hit an apocalyptic point in the universe and in the world, hey, guess what? We started being nice to each other again. We started being uh, cognizant of people's uniqueness and we started celebrating it. All right, cool. It's about flipping time. Let's keep that motivated and going. All right. So we can do that as nurses by remembering individuals within a cultural framework do not think similarly. Not necessarily. They don't have stereotypes, right? Their culture and their ethnicity does not come with a precursor or a warning label. That's not how life works or people for that matter, all right? There's so much diversity within a cultural group that across cultural groups, you can't really say that anything is quote unquote cultural because the idea of culture is an individualized preference. So please understand that we're boxing things in for no apparent reason other than we just need something to do with ourselves. And now we're learning how to unbox that system of belief as nurses. So please understand everyone is unique and their own individual person and then everything will be fine. I want to talk to you guys about therapeutic communication techniques. It's very, very important that we do this, right? So when we're expressing things to people during an interview, we're going to say, hey, if you had a colonoscopy, do you remember when you had your last one? Or when's your last flu shot? These are questions that we would ask. Rather than saying, have you had regular colonoscopies? Haven't you? Or you have had them, haven't you? Right? Do you see how like nasty that sounds? Yikes. Or we can uh, mix up medical terminology and really confuse people like, uh, yeah, you had an MI. Uh, or have you ever had an MI or a CVA? And everyone's like, what the heck is an MI or a CVA, right? Because they're not nurses, they're not docs, right? They have no idea. So we would say hypertension uh, instead of high blood pressure in this case, because most people don't know what hypertension is. CVA versus stroke. We wouldn't say CVA, we would say stroke, right? People know what that means. Or heart attack versus MI or myocardial infarct. They're going to be like, what the heck is that? Um, we need to use the approach that goes against the grain of, I know what's best for you and you should do what I say. Man, if any nurse ever did that, I just want to be in the room with a bucket of popcorn because that's the kind of show I want to watch. That's crazy, right? So we need to ask the appropriate questions. Hey, when have you had your last flu shot, if you can recall? Or if you can recall, when did you have your last colonoscopy? Or when did you have your last mammography, right? Um, that way it jogs the memory. It's an innocent question. We're not making anyone angry. So uh, biographical data is the client is an 84-year-old female. This has given us a bio when we are talking about a health history to let us know a little bit about this patient so that we can go ahead and paint a picture in our head, right? Family history. Uh, mother and maternal grandmother both have breast cancer. Okay, so I got an 84 year old who has had mammography since she was 40 years old. Family has a history of breast cancer, mother and grandmother, so she's at an increased risk, but I've probably been doing these mammographies since she was 40 because that's pretty much normal. So I'm gonna ask her when was her last uh, mammography and at 84 years old, they probably have already stopped her with those things, right? Because um, they usually only have a small window and once they get into their 80s, if it hasn't been a thing, it's not gonna be a thing. So they usually shut down that uh, to cut cost and to cut time out of the patient so they can have a better quality of life. Like, why do we need something that we don't need? There you go. Reason for seeking care. We need to know why they're at the hospital. They're at the hospital for shortness of breath and chest pain, or they're at the hospital because they have pain in their leg because they fell or whatever that looks like. Past health history is going to let me know what they had and when they had it. Patient had a heart attack in 2018. That's kind of important to know. I'm going to make sure I'm going to listen to those, uh, auscultate those heart sounds very, very carefully, right?
Klein's Catholic and attends Mass regularly. That's biographic data again. This is important because it paints a picture of who they are from a spiritual side. So I know when I talk to them, I have to approach them in a certain type of way because I understand that if they attend Mass regularly and they are Catholic, then that means their religion is very strong to them. And I need to make sure that I say things that are appropriate to them to let them know that I care about them so that I can build that rapport and I can get implicit trust in all the information that I need. Right. So I hope that makes sense to you. Please understand which piece of data goes together with what component of health history. All right. So um, when we are interviewing older adults, we need to be very careful. Older adults have a little bit harder of a time processing information, not because they're they're dim, not because they're slow and old. It's because a lot of times they could have something going on that's going to affect their cognition um, or their um, past health history recollection or anything of that nature because, you know, they could be in pain and all they could think about is that pain. So they really can't answer you that fast. Or maybe they have a history of Alzheimer's. Maybe they are in the process of having a acute UTI and they're nearly there. So they're a little bit snippy or a little bit more nervous. So they can't recall things and they don't know why. Um, so we usually want to give them a little more time uh, to conduct a comprehensive health history. We want to give them probably an extra couple of minutes. And if they are thinking, we don't need to interrupt them. We need to just let it ride until they have come to a complete conclusion so that we can better assist them. Now, when we're interviewing clients who are in physical or emotional distress, we need to be cognizant of what that looks like for them. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a doctor who has been in a room while a patient is about to get pain medication, the nurse is trying to get into the computer and give them some morphine. The doctor intervenes, says, get out of my way, gets into the computer to do their assessment, and the doctor's like, give them the medicine, and they're like, I haven't scanned the medicine, and they refuse to get out of the computer system. So at that point, that doctor needs to get out of that room and leave me alone as a nurse so that I can appropriately take care of my patient's pain because that information that that doctor is going to receive is going to be a bunch of F-bombs because that patient knows that their meds are not being given because they are taking up space and that nurse knows that that patient is going to be in pain and is feeling that pain on an empathic level with them because that doc has not exited that room like they need to. So if we are seeing someone holding something like their abdomen or their leg and we know they're about to get pain medication and we know that they're feeling terrible, we don't go in there to bug them. We tell the nurse that's in there, hey, listen, I'm the wound nurse. I understand you're the floor nurse. I'm going to let you finish. I'm going to go sit in the physician's lounge. Why don't you come get me when you're finished giving them pain meds and then I'll come talk to them. It's that simple. All right, next slide. Okay, so when we are interviewing a client with a sensory or hearing cognitive or cognitive impairment, we need to speak slow and clearly. We need to face the individual so they can see our face because a lot of times if they miss words in between, they can still see our facial expression and recognize what it is we're trying to say. Remember, it's everything, right? Individuals with hearing impairment, um, they sometimes will turn up the TV very loud turn it off while you're talking to them or turn it down, but mostly turn it off, right? Because we want them to have our time and attention and we want to give it in return. And we can't if somebody is screaming, right? It's not something that's going to happen. Hold the interview in a quiet room or in other private area without any noise. It's very important that you do those things because we want to have a solid environment where they're not going to be distracted and we get all of the information that we need so that we can get a, a, an abrupt to synopsis very quickly of what's going on with the patient and what we can do to help intervene with uh, their disease process immediately. All right, because we want them at baseline as fast as we can. From the moment they come into the hospital, we're thinking about discharging them, which means we fix them. Okay, this is the conclusion of part one of two parts of your comprehensive overview. It's 48 minutes long. It's going to take me forever to download onto YouTube, which is cool. Like I get it. So I'm going to go into class because I am eight minutes late. I'm going to take my class. And then when I get back from class, I will post it and we'll be good to go. I will see you for part two. Okay, I've had a couple hours of sleep. I feel better. I feel chipper. It is three in the morning. 
and we are going to record some slides. So hand hygiene, isolation precautions, and uh, PPE equipment. Um, hand hygiene is performed before and after direct contact with the patient. I say this because there are a lot of times where I see people, <laughs> oh boy, this is going to be gross. Sometimes I see people cleaning a wound, right? They, um, they unpack the wound, repack the wound, and while they're going to wash their hands, the patient goes, hey, can you get me a drink real quick? <laughs> oh God, <laughs> cringeworthy, ready? And here's what they do. <laughs> do you think they go wash their hands? No, they hand them the drink. And then we've just stuck everything. I, they're wearing gloves. I get it. That's fine. Blah, da, da. But it's just nasty. Just nasty. I mean, what if you take your gloves off and properly? What if one snaps and breaks? There's a million things that can go wrong. Just wash your daggone hands, right? Hit it with Sterilite if, if it's a, a dry wound, right? So that you have something sanit sanitized if they're like freaking out and kicking and screaming. But a patient's going to wait 30 seconds for you to wash your hands to hand them something, or they're going to ask for somebody else to do it. It's, it's okay to wait 30 seconds to do it. Do not finish a procedure and then go to another task without first washing your hands. I know this sounds so stupid, but I've seen tenured nurses in the ICU and the region's leader of a hospital in their area in a very, very prominently known facility. <laughs> I'll say it's the top five in the United States. I'll go as far to say it's in the top three and leave it at that. These things happen. It doesn't matter what hospital it is, what network it is, how fantastic it is, how many beds it has. It's the company you keep within yourself that matters because integrity is doing the right thing when nobody is watching and nobody knows. Integrity is a big deal, all right? Uh, I, I talk a lot about integrity, but I'm also the first one that finds a loophole or a creative way to figure out something. And a lot of people go, huh, how is that a thing? Because when we're talking about the, the end all be all big stuff, there is no way you're going to get me to yield, period. If it's something silly, like, uh, I don't know, I was, I was 45 minutes late to class one day, but you know, I popped a tire. Cool. I got you. Don't worry about it. If it's something like, I'm going to literally, you know, wipe my mouth after I just got through doing a procedure without washing my hands first, or I'm going to hand someone a soda. Are you crazy? Okay. I've talked about it for three minutes. Um, please understand that PPE includes uh, gloves, gown, goggles, mask in some cases, depending on what that looks like. And we're going to talk about it just a little bit more in the next slide. Um, and then we're going to move on to uh, inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, and vital signs. Okay, so if you notice, the first bullet of this slide is identical to the one prior. Hand hygiene is performed before and after direct contact with the patient, okay? When you're dealing with a patient with C. diff specifically, all right, C. diff is a big deal. Uh, it is a infection that can spread very easily. Um, as a nurse who's very healthy, am I going to get C. diff? Well, I mean, anybody could theoretically, but it's usually for immunocompromised or someone who's had a very, very hard course of antibiotic therapy for a long time for whatever reason. Um, we need to have gloves on when we get there. We need to wear a mask with eye protection or face shield. And we need to have, be donned with a gown because I'm sorry when you change somebody and they're in C. diff precaution. The idea is that C. diff is explosive watery diarrhea. So guess what happens when people need change because they're elderly and need an incontinent pad or an incontinent brief? It's explosive and watery. I, like, I don't know how else to do this. To you guys but um, you're gonna be seeing the cold hard facts if you haven't already so this is how this works so if you are changing somebody or even getting into the bed knowing that they have this condition it's probably gonna create some leakage and leakage that goes into a bed and then you have no gloves on 
or a gown on is then going to spread onto your skin, onto your scrubs and go straight to the neutropenic precaution room that you have across the hallway that they've decided to give you because nobody ever thinks about acuity and the level of acuity and how that matters in the grand scheme of life. Because right now it's all about just plugging in people with as many patients as you can, because guess what? I can't get you guys graduated fast enough because we are in such a high deficit nationwide because nurses ran the scared ones did the ones that didn't those were the guys that could eat glass I swear they can I'm one of those guys so I want you to be one of those guys and understand this but do it properly right we got kind of slack since COVID's happened because well there was an apocalypse. Like, I get that. <laughs> there was a worldwide apocalypse, and we all made it. Congratulations, friends. We all made it. Everybody that's listening to this, you made it. So, for those who didn't, we need to remember and honor them by doing the right thing so that this doesn't happen to anybody else or nobody gets any other nosocomial infection because we can't be bothered to wash our daggone hands. So, wash your hands before and after. Okay, I'm done almost three minutes on the slide. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. So remember with C. diff precaution though, specifically gloves, mask with eye protection or a face shield, gown. Cool. All right. Okay. So inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation in that order. So the term inspection refers to data obtained by visual examination of the body. This includes movement, posture, uh, smell, you know, things of that nature. So when we're talking about inspecting, uh, specifically lungs or cardiac system, we observe the shape of the chest. We pay attention to the breathing. We note the respirations. We note the rate. We note the depth. We note the effort. Okay. If we have one side of the chest that's expanding higher than the other, er, that might be a problem. Er, that's a huge problem. So. Um, we would do that prior to palpating. Now, palpating is uh, using your hands to feel things like temperature, texture, size, shape, consistency, pulsation, and location of certain parts of the body. So why would I need to use this? Well, I have a rash. Okay, well, is that is that rash uh, erased? Well, I don't know. Okay, cool. Pretend that you can't see, close your eyes, and see if it feels like braille, okay? If it does, it's raised. We need to know if it's raised because some types of rashes are raised versus receded, okay? That is going to dictate the course of our process of healing that wound or healing that, <clears throat> excuse me, healing that rash, so we have to do those things. Temperature is the easiest thing that you can use with the idea of palpation. Oh, okay, I feel a little warm in here. Hmm, let me see. Okay, cool, yep, you feel warm, that's accurate. Let me take your temperature, yep, 99.9. .9. Well, let's get some blankets off of you and see what's going on because we might need to give you a Tylenol if you exceed 100.1, because that's usually the protocol. Um, let's see, direct percussion. Percussion is the tapping of the finger over like a sinus cavity of the forehead. Um, that is going to be uh, appropriate because if it is filled with fluid, it's gonna sound hard as a rock. And if it's nice and airy, like it's supposed to be, it's gonna sound uh, a little more, it's gonna have a little more timpani behind it, right? It's gonna sound like a little bit more of a drum rhythm. Again, these sights and sounds and smells are so finite and they're variants sometime. In other words, they're so, they're so fine in their differences that you have to have a keen eye and ear open to the world around you. That's why I always talk about energy, frequency, and vibrational pattern. If you understand those three processes and you understand how that moves in this world, and if you understand what that means, then you're going to be okay. Case in point, uh, frequency. Well, why does this matter, Professor Molly? All right, cool. I'm so glad that she brought up this contingency point. It's very simple. Every alarm in a hospital that is set at a higher frequency is meant to tell you, hey, dummy, somebody's dying. Okay? So those high-pitched alarms that you get so annoyed that you got to get up to go check on, those alarms are going off because either a ventilator has lost its oxygenation or it's kinked. 
that's kind of a big deal if someone's incapacitated and I'm keeping them alive with mechanical ventilation. Or it's because someone has gone asystole. Uh, that's a big deal because they're flatlined and I might need to go ahead and shock them, right? Or it's a wound vac that has a seal break. Well, that's a big deal because after two hours, I have to pull off the whole pack and put it on back again. And let's hope to God I don't rip off any skin with it. Let's hope to God I haven't damaged the skin or nothing's perforated that, that entryway or nothing's gotten into that entryway to continue an infection I'm trying to get rid of. High-pitched alarms, high-frequency alarms are meant to scare you for a reason. That's why when cops come by, it's high frequency because higher frequencies can be heard at a longer range, all right? Frequency, energy, vibration, energy, frequency, vibration. It's all there. It's in everything that we do. It's in the whole way that we understand the world around us. So if you can get with that, you can get with anything, all right? All right, move on to the next slide. So with vital signs, normal temperature readings range from 97 to 99. However, they are going to fluctuate because people are different. I uh, carry a lower temperature. Um, my family naturally carried a lower temperature growing up. So I'm 97.4, 97.5. So when somebody sees that, they think, oh my God, are you is something wrong? No, nothing's wrong. That's perfectly normal for me. I carry a low blood pressure. I carry a low temperature. I have hemophilia. Like it's just, it's just what you do, right? I, 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 you know, carry a, a hemoglobin that sometimes gets a little bit lower because sometimes I have iron deficiency anemia. Again, it's all part of the process. It's all part of the dictatorship of the disease process. It's, it is what it is. All right. No big deal. Keep on moving. Keep on keeping on. Lots of people have lots of diseases. It should never stop you from wanting to be your best self every day of your life. Because the bottom line is, whether you've got one day here or 200 years here, if it's a bad one day or a bad 200 years, what's the purpose? There's none. If you're not helping somebody out every day, what's, what's the, why are we even here? What's the purpose? So that I can gratify myself? Why was I even born? Why would I even need to be born to gratify myself? If no gratification is even needed. So do something for somebody else. That will give you gratification. That's why you're in nursing school. Come on. This is who you are already. This is how you're wired. That's why I love and I'm proud of all of you guys. I don't say it just for the sake of saying it to shake hands and kiss babies. I'm not a politician. I'm saying it because I implicitly love the core of your being. And I'm proud of you for what you're trying to accomplish. So 97 to 99. Normal ranges. Oral temp is going to be a little bit higher than an axillary temp. There's a variance of about one degree. So if I hear from my STNA, hey, their temperature was 101.2. Cool. How'd you do it? I did it axillary. Eh, it's 102.2. We got a big problem. All right. Big difference in the two. One variance of or one degree of variance can actually make the difference between you give a medication or not, which in a six hour period can be the difference between somebody getting super sick or not. So we have to make sure we understand how it comes. And that's why in your epic charting, it's going to specify how did you do your temperature? All right. Also note that if someone has increased respirations, Fever might be a contributor to that. We really, we rarely look at temperature. I don't know why. Nurses barely pay attention to temperature. So they'll take a temp. It'll be, I don't know, 98.1. And then they'll look at a temp after four hours and go 99.0. And they'll go, all right, well, it's a low grade. I'm not even worried about it. I'm not even going to give them Tylenol until 100. Why don't you go in there and find out why they fluctuated so much in a matter of four hours? Check the respirations next. If the respirations are increased, even if it's 14 to 19, that much of a degree in variance in a period of four hours is enough to establish that something might be trying to circle the drain. When I say circle the drain, I mean when you flush the toilet, everything settles at the top and then it starts to circle and then things start to go down the drain. Okay, this is what happens with the person. Most people that die in a patient facility, when we go back and look, that death was preventable 12 to 15 hours prior. Do you know the first vital sign that is increased exponentially? That is the first thing that you see when you see someone going to sepsis. Anybody know? It's respirations. 
We barely care about respirations. I've seen people who have had 12 respirators for an entire 12 hour shift. Oh my God, Molly, how does that happen? It doesn't. They lied. They, they were in a hurry and they just copy and pasted it over because nobody looks at respirations until it's too late. Until it's too late. It's a big deal. So no, if a person has a fever and increased respirators, it's probably because of the fever. All right. That's, that's what we got to kill off first. All right. Uh, respiratory rate ranges from 12 to 20. Again, increase in respiration rate can be a result of pain, fever, or anxiety. All right. Or 9,000 other things, but more importantly, it, it's a result of a fever, um, or, or a pain process. So heart rate goes from 60 to 100. Again, there's degrees of variance and people carry a little bit lower and believe it or not, that's normal. Marathon runners traditionally carry heart rates while they're sleeping in 48, 49 range. Cool. Good for you. I'm not going to go run 23 point. I don't even know how many miles, but there's a sticker on someone's car. So I know it's around that range. Good for those guys. Not for me because I'm not doing it right. But everyone's a little bit different. A heart rate that is in this range does not necessarily contribute to an increase in respirators. So if you see someone who goes from 60 heart rate to 100 heart rate within a matter of an hour, it is probably not uh, going to be a contributor to the respirations itself. Not at that point, at least. A normal blood pressure is below 120 over 80. Most people think that it's 120 over 80. No, the word is below. If it is above that, then we are starting to get in uh, like a pseudo hypertensive state, right? Or uh, walking a line of um, abnormal. Elevated blood pressure does not contribute to an increase in respiration rate. Please understand that. If there's an increase in respirators, this has got to do with the basics. Pain, fever, anxiety, or we're trying to get sepsis. Big deal. Big, big deal. Okay, next slide. Okay, cool. So pain assessment. All right. I know that you guys have seen, a lot of you at least, have seen. No, all of you have. Because nursing's common sense. Let's take this back to the town where it belongs. Let's keep it out of the hospital. Let's put it back to the town. How many of you have got a grandma's, cousin's, uncle, whatever, who is sitting there with cancer? And you ask them, hey, how are you doing? Are you in pain? And they're like, no, I'm cool. And you're like, what are you talking about? You got uh, stage four cancer. That's got to be painful. Heck yeah, it's painful, but not for them. You know why? Because they build a tolerance of that pain. Pain is weird. Chronic pain is a compilation and a steady increase in pain over a period of time. Therefore, it doesn't hurt as bad. Whereas the receptors of an acute process is going to be like hot fire and it is going to burn like the Dickens. Believe it or not, I have known cancer patients who are completely cool with their cancer and managing it and managing the pain of their cancer without taking anything. And I'm talking stage four people. It just depends on what type of cancer. And they will go out for a walk in the daytime, you know, when they're in between chemo treatments and they will sprain their ankle and they will go in the hospital for their sprained ankle, but not be concerned about their cancer. <laughs> Okay, sounds super creepy and weird. Let me explain how it works. In the brain, we have receptors, and these receptors send signals. Again, energy, frequency, vibrational pattern. So these signals that the brain sends around says, hey, this hurts like heck. And they go, okay, well, we're going to make pain so the person stops. And they go, well, this is a different kind of pain. This isn't a bone pain. This is a pain in the body. And we're just going to go ahead and let them know very lightly that something is happening to them and they should probably do something about it immediately. And the other receptor goes, all right, I'll just make it a, a fair amount of pain, right? So then a person might get a chest pain and then they might not do anything about it. So then that pain increases just a little bit and goes, hey, they're not paying attention to what I'm telling them. So I need to increase this pain a little bit because their disease process is getting a little bit worse in that chest. And they go, okay, well, make it a little bit worse. And then the patient builds up a tolerance again. All right, so it's the same process of building up a tolerance over a period of time and not recognizing that this is a big deal. A lot of things in this world, believe it or not, are in fact mind over matter. Do you know that we have statistical data and studies from Harvard 
um, that say if we tell this group of cancer patients over here that we're giving them cutting edge medicine and they're going to have better outcomes, better performance, and they're going to have better overall uh, quality of life, those guys live longer in their in their dying process and their staging process. Some of them retroactivate their stage of cancer. Huh? Crazy. You can go from a four to a three. Is that really a thing? Oh, yes, it is. I can show you all the the 9000 different uh, journals that we have that validate that information. In these same uh, studies, we have people and we go, you know, we're going to do everything we can. We're going to give you the proper medicine. This is probably how much time we have, give or take. Um, and we're going to do everything we can to help develop you and foster you so that you can have a better quality of life. And those people usually make it to the point of expectation, uh, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit shorter. So what's the difference? The difference is the signal that they sent to their brain when they heard that energy, frequency, and vibrational pattern that that first initial doctor gave them that told them, how much longer do I have? That is the only number that people want to believe. Until that number goes up, then they'll believe that doctor. But the part of death is very, very weird because some people are told you've got six months to live and depending on how they handle that they might just give up and if you give up you're not going to make it six months there are other people that try to make it that six months because they have a graduation and it's the craziest thing in the world it almost always happens historically it almost always happens case in point my father he was dying of cancer he had mesothelioma because he worked on railroads because he didn't read or write or speak very uh, well of English. So he didn't have a lot of opportunities like I did, right? So he stayed on train tracks and he got into asbestos in the caboose, right? Because it just used to fly everywhere. I remember being in the caboose with him and it would be like snow and I would laugh and giggle about it, right? Like this is just what she did. So he was dying of cancer and he goes, no, I'm going to wait until you graduate with your doctorate. I'm going to see that before I die, because if I get that accomplished, then I have done everything I can in my whole entire life, right? I have made it and I have helped you make it to yourself and be who you are as your best self. And that's all I want to see. That's all I care about. I'm here to tell you, friends, he watched me graduate. And then he looked at me and he said, um, I'm ready. And I said, cool. And he was gone a week later because he had nothing else. He had accomplished everything he ever wanted and he was tired and he was weary. And at that point, he was at peace. So this is how we need to approach our patients. We need to understand that what they believe in their head is in fact real because it's real to them. And if it's real to them, it's gonna be a reality in its inception. Please understand that. If my dad would have told me he needed to wait a whole nother year, I have no doubt in my mind he would have done whatever he could to watch that graduation. And I see it all the time. I'm waiting for my grandmother. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm waiting for, you know, my grandmother to turn 100. Like, I have to fight for this. I, I'm ready to graduate nursing school. I have to fight this cancer. I, I, I'm waiting to watch my first grandbaby be born. I have to fight this. And they do. Because the, the mental process is that powerful. If you tell your brain to tell your body what's going on, nine times out of 10, your body's going to go, okay, because the body is ruled by the brain and the brain rules over the entire world supreme as far as you're concerned. So when someone says that they're in pain, they're in pain, period, point paragraph. I don't care if they're sitting there text messaging you in a 10 out of 10 of pain. If they look at you casually and go, it's 10 out of 10, by God, that's their 10 out of 10. Now, does everyone tell the truth? No. Do most people tell the truth? Yeah, they do. They really do. Because you're in a hospital and if you're in pain, you're going to tell me you're in pain because you know I got the good stuff to make the pain go away. That's why you're in a hospital. That's why you wait 45 minutes to 15 hours to just get into a bed, right? Sometimes days. Sometimes you're in the ER. So keep these things in mind when you want to roll your eyes because the drug addict who's been in withdrawal for a day tells you that they're in a 10 out of 10 of pain and they're text messaging. They've been through withdrawal before. They know that if they don't keep calm, they're going to go throw in furniture across the room and the security guards are going to come in and they're going to tase them and they're not going to like that very much. So they're trying to keep their composure and they're trying to give you an opportunity to help them. 
So guess what, friends? Help them. Don't be that guy. I see it all the time. So what we need to do to determine pain is we need to ask the patient to rate the pain that they're experiencing at that moment. Simple. We literally look at them and go, can you rate the pain that you're experiencing right now? Can you rate the pain being experienced? That's all you need to do. All right. I'm going to let you read the rest of these because I think I've already, you know, swarmed the castle with the eight minutes that I spent on this slide. But it's that important to me that you don't look at somebody because they're homeless or because, I don't know, they're a chronic patient. Or, you know, they, they have an exacerbation of sickle cell disease and they're sitting in bed laughing and cutting up, but they're at a 10 out of 10 pain level and they're on a PCA pump getting morphine at the drop of a dime and they ask for more morphine for breakthrough pain. They're not lying to you. They're professional patients, right? They're frequent flyers because they have a disease process that is just jaw-breaking of pain, but they're never going to let you know. Because you're going to be just like every other nurse when you look at them like, yeah, right. And they're never going to trust you. So don't be that guy, right? Do your old cart, which we're about to talk to about in a couple of minutes. Make sure you understand that pain. And if it's not working for them, talk to the doc about increasing your pain medication. Nobody wants to be in pain. Duh. All right, next slide. All right, old cart. So let's talk about old cart. It's important. OCART is an acronym which means uh, assessing pain by the onset, location, duration, character, aggravating or uh, alleviating factors, radiation, and timing. So what does that mean? Well, onset means uh, what were you doing when it started? So I broke my leg. Okay, cool. What were you doing when you started the break of your leg that caused your pain? Like, tell me what happened. All right, that's going to be your idea of onset. Where, what were you doing when you first felt the pain? Location, where is the pain? <laughs> Duration, is it constant? Does it free flow? Does it come in spikes, right? Character, describe the pain. Is it stabbing, right? Is it, is it dull and annoying, right? Um, is it shooting? Because there's a difference between stabbing and shooting, I can promise you. Aggravating or relieving factors, what makes it better, what makes it worse? Radiation, does it go anywhere, right? Does it go uh, into your jaw when you have that little weird crushing feeling that you have in your chest? Does it radiate to your left arm? Yikes, that's a problem. How about we go ahead and get some troponins and EKG? Go ahead and run that through because I'm pretty sure we might be having an MI. All right, timing, how long is the pain? How long have you had this pain? All right, has it been a day or a week? Because if you've had a pain for six months, that's a chronic condition. That's not an acute condition. Is it getting worse? Wait, do we need to go ahead and do some scans? Do you might have, do you might have cancer? Did you, did you, did you might, uh, did you maybe blow out a disc? Like, what are we doing here? This is a concept of old cart. Now for the purposes of your examination, what I'm probably gonna do is pick one of these guys and I'm gonna tell you to pick a phrase that best suits that part of the acronym. So I might tell you, okay, um, an example of duration on a patient, or a, an example of requesting duration uh, from a patient would look like, and then I would say something along the lines of, A, uh, how long is the pain? B, describe the type of pain, right? Uh, C, is the pain constant? D, where is the pain? And then you have to choose which one is the right. Does that make sense? Okay, next slide. All right, so we're gonna talk about perception and response to pain. So pain tolerance is the duration or intensity of a pain a person will endure before outwardly responding. So how much pain can I take before I'm finally moaning and groaning basically? So culture, uh, their experiences, their role behaviors, their phys physical and emotional health influences pain tolerance. So some of us have a very high pain tolerance. I am one of those people that have a very high pain tolerance. I've had four babies. Uh, I've not had a single Tylenol for any of them. Um, I'm usually pretty cool until water breaks and then it sucks for about an hour and then I'm done and I'm back up making my bed five minutes later. If I'm in pain, if you ever see me wincing, oh buddy, it's bad. It's real, real bad. So 
my perception of pain is I'm about to go have a baby. All right, well, that sucks. So I'm 10 centimeters and I'm walking back and forth and my water is still not broken. And they go, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm cool. And they're like, what's your pain? I'm like, zero. And they're like, but you're 10 centimeters. I'm like, yep, but you haven't broken my water. When you do that, it's going to suck. But for right now, I'm cool. Could you get me a drink? I'd really like some ice chips with a little bit of grape juice on it. That's delicious, right? And then you have some people that if they stub their toe, it's a 10 out of 10, right? You usually see this, and, and I'm not going to pick on anybody. I, I, that's not my place in this world to do that, to pick on anybody. But you usually see this when uh, you deal with people who have never had to experience pain before. Um, or have experienced pain on a very small level. So if somebody stubs their toe really bad, that's a new pain. And that's a very sensitive type of pain because you got to think receptors on your toes aren't usually jarred. So when a pain receptor comes in from the toe, they get really excited. They're like, hey, now's my time to shine. And they hit it and they hit it hard, right? It's like somebody being picked for the first time to go play a sport. They're like, man, I'm going to kill it. I'm going to hit that ball out the court, right? I don't even think that those two frameworks work because I don't think there's a sport where you can hit the ball out of the court and it'd be a good thing. Anyways, digressing. You get what I'm trying to say here. Um, so just make sure that you understand no two people are going to have the same type of pain tolerance. So you could go to one room and someone's having a baby and go, hey, what's your pain? And they're like, it's a 10 out of 10. And you're like, dude, you're four centimeters deep. Calm down. And then you can go to my room and I'm, you know, shucking and jiving and doing a little dance, getting ready for this baby to come out. Right. And I'm, I'm 10 out of 10 ready to go. Um, it just depends. So please understand that the difference between the two is the two patients is their pain tolerance. All right, next slide. All right, uh, we're going to talk about chronic pain, and we talked a little bit about it, so this isn't going to take very long. Patients with chronic pain adapt to the pain and have more subtle manifestations than patients with acute pain despite the effects of pain medication. Okay, what? Like, why can't you put this in English? Why can't you, why do you have to overcomplicate things to sound important? Do you really need validation that bad, honey? Seriously? No. Here's what they're trying to tell you. What they're trying to tell you is people with chronic pain have adapted. They're used to the pain, right? And people who have uh, chronic pain aren't going to muddle and roll around in the ground because they know that crying is only going to make it worse. They know that showing attention to that pain is only going to influence the level and intensity of that pain. This is simple parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system process. This is autonomic nervous system stuff. I will be teaching you this in our next class after our examination. It's a very simple process. I've mentioned it to you a couple of times, but it literally dictates everything that you do in medicine. And if you understand these two simple concepts, you can understand the entire disease process and what the body's going to do and how to fix it. Okay. You also can figure out how to answer an NQEX question appropriately or a standardized test question because you know the difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic process and what that's going to mean and what you need to do to fix it. Okay. If you know that little bit of information, you've got everything, whether you know the disease process or not. All right. It's just simple facts. Uh, like I said, I'll explain later. I don't want to complicate it. We're going to the first exam. We're going to make this nice and sweet and super simple. So going back to the ridiculously proper English, what we're trying to say is subtle manifestations of pain and chronic pain people are not going to be, uh, you know, someone rolling dramatically on the ground. They're going to wince. They're going to go, right? Sometimes I, like I have, uh, I, I've, I've, I have, you know, been a, a gym person for a while and uh, I boxed for a while and um, I've been an athlete for a while uh, and I, I used to get chronic uh, broken toes, right? That's just a normal thing you do um, when you are, you know, traditional boxing or kickboxing or doing MMA, anything like that. You just break toes. It is what it is. You tape them together, you keep moving. So it's really easy for me to break a toe. As like, a matter of fact, I had a broken toe, I believe, uh, three months ago. I was going down the stairs, turned it wrong, fell to snap. I was like, here we go again, right? And I was fine after a week. Um, I walked on it the first day. It was kind of rough. I would wince a little bit. No limp. You would never even know. Um, I think one person looked at me and said, hey, what, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, huh? And they're like, you just went, and I'm like, oh, uh, it's a Southern thing. Just like, mm, how you doing? Like, how's, how's, how's your mom and them? Mm, right? And I just played it off. Um, but for an average person that breaks a toe for the first time, it's a big deal, right? Because acute pain feels differently. Acute pain, first off, it ain't cute at all. Uh, I think one person might have just laughed at that. But acute pain um, versus chronic pain, acute pain is going to stab you like a knife, 
So if I get bit by an ant, I'm going to feel that more than I would actually feel a broken toe because I've been dealing with broken toes for, I don't know, 20 years now. So it's no big deal. You just keep moving, right? Like I said, next, the Gen X people, like they're, we're just a whole different breed of, breed of people. Like I always say that we're the, we're the feral children, the last, the last breed of feral children, uh, before it got better. <laughs> so a lot of us don't complain about a lot of things for a lot of different reasons. So just remember that when you have a patient who's in their late thirties to, you know, forties to fifties, it's just pretty normal. All right. I think I have exhausted that one to death. So there you go. All right. I told you guys Latin matters to me, and it does, because if you know what your prefix and your suffix means, you know what the disease process is, even if you never even heard of it before, okay? So card means heart, so like cardiology, the study of the heart. Pulmo means lung, gastro means belly, neuro means brain, Odo, remember how, I, how we use an otoscope, and I said Odo means ear? Well, it does, all right? Ortho means bone, hemat means blood. So if I get a hematocult, I'm getting an occult stool to check for blood. Duh. So I want you to know these. I know that you guys are already doing medical terminology, yada, 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 and it keeps bothering you every day, blah, blah, blah. But there's a reason I'm doing it because if you don't know these basics, then it's going to kick you in the tail when somebody gives you osteomyelitocardiomegaly and you're like, huh, what? Right? That's kind of a big deal. But you need to know that this is happening because this is happening, which is affecting this, which is affecting that, period. So know your, know your prefixes and suffixes. Know that things like itis means inflammation. You guys know this. So again, I like for us to have good opportunities to have good points and still learn something in between it all. So learn those things, read those things, understand those things. All right, next slide. Oh, my friends, we're going back to pathophysiology and anatomy. So I know that you guys probably didn't have a heavy pathophysiology load. I know you guys had a little bit of anatomy. When I was in college a billion and a half years ago, uh, I went to Wright State, my alma mater, whoop, whoop, the, the university that started it all, little old Wright State, built for, uh, built for uh, children with disabilities who wanted to go to college. So they have a tunnel system for people who... Uh, need handicap accessible ways of getting to class. So the entire tunnel system is like Rome in which you could just walk into any caveat or corridor that you need to. Um, these guys also have an anatomical gift program and an anatomical gift program is a center where people donate their bodies to science. So when I die, guess where I'm going? Back to where it began at Wright State because I think it's a great idea. So one of the cool things that I got to do is I had two anatomical gifts, which means I had two people, and my job with those two people was to dissect them. So when I say dissect them, I mean dissect them down to the half. So one week we would have the leg and we would you know, dissect down to the muscle group. And then beyond that, we would dissect down to the bone. Um, sometimes we would, uh, they would give us a head and go here, crack it in half and see what it looks like. <laughs> Most of them were already cracked in half so we could go ahead and pinpoint everything. But that's how we did our anatomy and pathophysiology. And part of that is understanding what cuts we have to give. All right, so this is heavy anatomy stuff here. Because if someone tells me to give a sagittal cut on that bone and I give an improper cut, um, then I look like an idiot and I have messed it up for the next people who are going to be coming behind me to learn that type of body part. All right, so here's how this works. Superior means you're above. All right, inferior means you're below. All right, so inferior would be the foot. Superior would be my head if I'm standing. All right. So we have posterior and anterior, or ventral versus dorsal, all right? You need to know both of them. Anterior means anything in front of you, or ventral. Posterior means anything behind you, or dorsal, all right? Please note that the anatomical position of the palms that are considered anterior or palms, the palm itself is facing towards the front of you, all right? Lateral means the sides, medial means the middle. Proximal means it's closer to me. Distal means it's farther away. All right. So if I say my first digit on my finger 
and the knuckle, the first knuckle on my finger, the first bend is going to be what? Proximal or distal to me? It's going to be distal. All right. How about if I say my wrist? My wrist is going to be proximal or distal to the rest of my body. Well, in relation to where we just talked about, it's going to be more proximal than the distal digit we just talked about. Does that make sense? All right. Next slide. All right, bed positions. These are the most common bed positions that we put people in. I'll tell you a little bit about it and why we do it. All right. So supine or what they call dorsal recumbent. Please remember dorsal recumbent, not for this examination necessarily, but please understand dorsal recumbent because it absolutely always, 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 Nikola Tesla three times, comes back as dorsal recumbent on the NCLEX. I've seen it so many daggone times in the billion years I've been a nurse that it's not even funny. Everyone goes, who the, what the heck is dorsal recumbent? And I'm like, oh my God, it's supine. Stop it. They're just trying to sound cool. People try to sound cool because they need validation. They can't just put things in layman's terms because at that point you could do it and they don't want you to do it. They don't want regular people to do all the sophisticated things we can all do. Okay, guess what? I was born regular. I'm gonna die regular. Regular is where I stay. Regular is fly forever as far as I'm concerned. So regular is what everyone's gonna get. It doesn't matter what knowledge I have in my brain. I'm not gonna talk that way. If someone wants to get cute and try to talk that way, I can talk over them, no problem. It's one of my favorite things to do, actually. I hope you guys are there when it happens because y'all will be like, oh, snap. Molly done got them. And it's fun, right? Because we laugh at the fact that we think we're superior, which is above your head, by the way. Remember, we just talked about it. But we're not. Nobody is more superior than anybody else, right? It's all about the power you give somebody else to believe what it is that you believe. So don't give anyone the power and they won't think it. How about that? Fowler's. Fowler's is sitting at a small degree of variance. It usually is uh, 30 to 60 degrees. We might have to quote on that. We might have to give that one to Dr. Google, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Usually 30, uh, 30 to 45, uh, 30 to 60. All right. Well, that doesn't matter for this exam. I, mm, now I really want to know. Mm, someone look at it and tell me what it is and then send me, send me a WhatsApp and let me know. And that'll tell me that, okay, you studied. All right, cool, cool. But anyways, Fowler's is going to be elevated slightly. How about that? Prone we use a lot, uh, specifically with COVID. Prone is something that we brought back into the game that we have not really done very much. We do it in the ICU when we need to, but it opens up the, the posterior aspect of the lungs. Remember posterior, right? The backside. So we want to do that because in the case of COVID, everything from the front isn't working well for them. So we try to get them laying on their back and we try to put a pillow in between so that they can get a better comfortable breath. Very important. Lateral is side lying. We're going to use that. Um, we're going to use a Sims position if we are giving. That is the ideal position. I call the Sims position. I'm so bummed out that I didn't have a picture of it. The Sims position I call the chalk outline that you see on like one of those cop shows. And they're all like sprawled out because we use that to give enemas. That's the, and there's going to be a question on that on your NCLEX, I'm sure. And it's literally going to be, what's the best position to give a patient an enema? And the answer is Sims, like the game that we used to play. Because they are simulating that they are in a, a quote unquote death state or the chalk outline state. So please remember that for later on. And then we have reverse Trendelenburg and Trondelenburg as well. So Trendelenburg, we use a lot in nursing because when someone's blood pressure is tanked and I don't have an order for fluids to bolus them, I can't give them a bolus until I talk to a doctor. But what I can do is I can flip them upside down and raise that pressure immediately. Are they going to be happy? No. Do I care? No. You're trying to die. I don't care. I don't care if it hurts your head. It's supposed to because I'm trying to feed your brain with oxygen so you don't pass out and die. Reverse Trendelenburg, we're going to use in a lot of other instances as well. Um, we use them in surgical procedures a lot. Uh, we keep someone in reverse Trendelenburg uh, if we need to uh, increase certain types of pressure that doesn't even matter right now because I'm going to overcomplicate things and, and make you confused. So I'm just going to stop right there. But just know that reverse Trendelenburg is the opposite of Trendelenburg and Trendelenburg is flipping someone upside down. And we use that most commonly with someone who uh, has very low blood pressure and isn't feeling well. And we kick them in Trendelenburg, get your tech to stay there and you go call a doc as fast as you can. That's how that works. Next slide. All right, rounding. So rounding is one of those things that most of the people in the class know how to do. However, comma, 
there are some people in this world that don't come from a country where rounding is something that you learn in grammar school. Can I also add that some people never even learn how to add and subtract negative numbers until they were 30 years old? Well, guess what? That 30 year old also attends Harvard. So don't make fun of them because you wouldn't make fun of me. How about that? I didn't learn math because math wasn't a thing where I grew up. Unless it was money math, it, it didn't happen. So things like rounding to the tens, hundreds, and thousands, I was scratching my head like the next person that doesn't get it. So we're never, ever, ever, never, never, never going to make fun of anybody for not understanding a concept that is basic to you. Because guess what? The concept of neurotransmitters is basic to me. But when I tell you, you're going to have your mouth wide open and your eyes might cross, okay? Because it's pretty complex stuff if you've never learned it before. Just like so is rounding. So I'm going to teach you rounding. And if you already know it, just go to the next slide. If you don't, it's cool. I'm right here with you. I've literally done it myself at the age of 30, okay? I started off at Wright State with academic probation. That means, hey, guess what? You screw up once and you're out because guess what I graduated high school with? A 2.25 GPA. How about that? 2.25 GPA. I barely graduated high school and I graduated 16 and a half because I just want to get the heck out of there. I didn't like the Western world. I just want to do whatever I need to do to get out the door and go. But it wasn't a direct reflection of my abilities. All right. This is your opportunity to turn it around and be somebody great because I'm here to tell you I graduated with my bachelor's, went straight to my bachelor's, didn't do my associates because I just was afraid I was going to quit if I did any other way. I wasn't as strong as you guys. And I graduated with a 3.9 and then, you know, went and got my doctorate or a couple other things and graduated again with, you know, a 3.85. So what you are is nothing about what you used to be. You had to be what you were to be who you are today. So be proud of that and be proud of who you're going to become and strive to become your best self, whatever that looks like to you right now. And when you get to that mark, you'll find that there's something else you want and go strive to achieve that as well. If for no other reason, do it so that you can say you did it for yourself and that you showed your children or your family that it can be done. So we stop this cycle of isms where people are caught in this lie of I've got to do this or I'm never going to be able to read or I'm never going to be able to go to school. I've heard that from my dad's indigenous side my entire life. I can't because we never. OK, great. Well, I've broken the barrier, right? That little shield that you guys have is is nothing but atmosphere now. What are you going to do? You going to do something about it? Or are you going to sit there and keep crying about how you can't read and write? I don't want to hear it because I've done it. I was the idiot that barely graduated high school. You guys graduated high school and you weren't the idiot. You guys graduated with good marks. So go be somebody else and quit talking about how tribe is going to keep you down. No, it's not. Tribe wants you to accelerate. My dad was there when I got my graduate degree. He was there when I got my doctorate. He was proud of me. All right. Let that be your legacy as well. That is really why I'm here to teach you, not to teach you nursing, but to teach you life. That is most important to me is what's going to happen for the rest of your existence and who you become and that legacy that you preach to other people. That's why I'm here and for no other reason. So when we're rounding, sorry, it took me four minutes to get there. When we're rounding. We have a tens, hundreds, and we have a whole number place. I'm not going to get into the thousands. We don't need to worry about it in medicine. What I will give you on an exam is I will say, hey, this number, 24.77, I want you to round it to the nearest whole number. So in this case, we're going to look at the number next to the whole number to the right, which is going to be in the tenths place, all right? So that number is seven. And anything five or greater, we're going to round up to one whole number extra. So 24.77, because I'm looking at that seven and it's higher than five, it becomes 25. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, send me a text. I will back you up. I get really, really angry because there's always some little slick kid that rolls their eyes when I talk about rounding and there's always five or six people. They're usually from a different country, a different area or a non-Western existence. And they are sitting there taking copious notes and they are getting laughed at by Slick Rick who thinks they're so daggone cute. Well, guess what? Slick Rick is usually the one that gets kicked out of the nursing program first or if they make it as a nurse, they're the one that gets the most complaints because they're so great and so grandiose that everybody else around them can't touch them, but nobody can stand them because they got nothing but venom in their heart and venom in their mouth and that's all they spit and nobody likes it. 
So don't be that guy. Let that be your warning. If I catch you in class doing this to somebody, it's not going to go well for you. Okay. Now let's talk about rounding to the nearest tenth if you are dealing with 100 digits. So if I'm rounding to the nearest tenth, remember I go right to one time. And for 3.726, I'm going to look at the number 2 because that's in the hundreds place. All right. I need to change or convert the tenths. All right. So the 2 is less than 5. So I would leave that 3.7 at 3.7. Similarly to the 4.2, I have 3 next to that in the hundreds place. And that 3 is lower than 5, so we stay at 4.2. Now, in the case of 17.5178, I have the number five in my tenths place, and the number one is going to be in the hundreds place, which is one number to the right, like we've been talking about. It's one. It's less than five. So I'm just going to keep it at 17.5, and that is how you round, and that is all there is to it, and that is all I'm going to ask of you. Okay? All right. Next slide. Okay. Percentages. Everyone freaks out with this problem, but there's nothing to freak out about because this is math that I do know. Because as indigenous people, we don't like to spend a lot of money because we don't have a lot of money to begin with. So, what we do is we go to sales, and when there's a sale, we know how to do percentages and we know what that percentage is going to mean because we know money math. If anybody knows money math, it's the indigenous. I'm just letting you know it's what we're real good at. So if you ever have money math problems or you ever want to know how to save money better or you ever want to know how to, I don't know, file some type of return where you get uh, subsidized housing or you get uh, energy uh, rewards back um, or you, you need some type of resource that is going to give you a financial resource, please come to me. Because this is how I lived my entire life and how we got by on the small income that we had, just me and my father. Because I'm an only child and he raised me by himself because he was a great, great man. The greatest man that ever lived, in my opinion. So that being said, here's money math. So the way that my dad taught me, and my dad did teach me this math, and I don't even know if it's real math, but it's the easiest math I can give you because it's one formula. You plug it in, you cross multiply, you're done. So in this case, a patient has consumed 20% of their prescription, which contains 60 tablets. The client has how many tablets remaining? I need for you to read these questions very easy. I need for you to pay attention to the questions because when I get a question like this, I have half of my students get it right because they paid attention and half of my students get it wrong. And the reason they get it wrong isn't because they're dumb or because they don't know the formula even. It's because they read how many tablets were consumed, not how many tablets were remaining. So please understand that you need to know this. So. Mental math, how can I do this? Well, 20 goes into 100 five times, so let's see. Hmm, 60 divided by five is 12, so 12 minus 60, or 60 minus 12 rather, is 48. Okay, 48's the answer. All right, that's my mental math because that's what I've learned, right? Like I, I can do really good mental money math, especially if I'm at, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue and, you know, Versace's got a big old fat sale. Like that's my jam, okay? But if you don't know how to do the mental math, here we go. First off, oh, Lord, no. Oh, Lord, no. We, we done got us a problem. We're all scared. Don't be scared. Take a breath. Listen. Remember, percent over 100 equals is over of. This is what my dad taught me, the guy that had a fifth grade education, who didn't read, who didn't write, who barely spoke English, okay, <laughs> who could barely sign his name on a check, and I wrote the rest of it out for him ever since I was five years old, he was one of the most genius guys in the world because he created this formula, if it's really a thing. I don't even know. Percent over 100 equals is over of. So we know the percentage. It's right there, 20%. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and get my little pen light so I can explain this really good. 20%, boom, right here. So then we put 20 where the percent goes. 100 is out of 100%, all right? That's why we put that there. Now, is over of, how do we use this? How we use this is we ask the question again. So... The client has consumed 20% of their prescription, which contain 60 tablets. So we would say, how many is remaining, which we don't know, and that's the answer that we need. How many is remaining of the 60 tablets? See how that works? All right, cool. So how many is remaining, and I know this in proper grammar, get over yourself. How many is remaining of the 60 tablets? Remember, this is my dad that did this, so don't make fun. And it works. It works every time. 
you'll then cross multiply. So 60 times 20, and then you're gonna divide by 100, and you're still gonna come up with the same answer, and the answer is gonna be 12, okay? And at that point, you'll know, all right, cool. How many are remaining? Well, we took 12, so we subtract 60 from 12, and we still get 48. That is how that's done. This is the formula you use. I've never had a problem with it in my entire existence. Versace always tries to cheat me on my shoes or on my belts or on my perfume or whatever. And I'm like, hey, yo, uh, why don't you go ahead and subtract it and deduct it by another $6.45 because y'all tripping. You don't know how to do your math. And I literally bust out my calculator on my phone, show it to them. And then, hey, guess what? I'm a little bit richer. So that's how that happens. This will always work for you. So long as you know how to plug it in, you're good. Percent over 100 equals is over of. Done. All right. Next slide. All right, so my final thoughts. My final thoughts are, you guys are gonna do really well if you pay attention and you take good notes. If I tell you to pay attention to it, if I speak it, and it has to do with the slides, it's gonna be something that you're gonna need to be able to recall, okay? Study it, don't trip over it. If you start freaking out, put it down, walk away, okay? If you are in a state of sympathetic nervous system response and you were, you were scared, you were nervous, you were freaking out, all this is gonna do is make you even more irrational. Again, I'm gonna teach you parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. And eventually around test three, you're gonna be like, whoa, what just happened? And like the clouds are gonna part, the sun's gonna shine, you're gonna be all kinds of happy. And you're gonna be like, dude, I get it, okay? Right now I'm just preaching a bunch of gibberish and you're like, why is this woman so crazy? Well, in order to be a genius, one must have a tincture of madness. If you don't believe me, well, talk to Socrates. He was pretty famous. He's the one that said it, right? Plato was also uh, predominantly known for saying something quite similarly, and so was Nikola Tesla, who was mm, the smartest guy who ever lived. So, yeah, cool. Call me crazy. I'll take it because that's flattering to me. So please listen to the words that come out of my mouth. I don't waste my time to tell you things that are going to just be a bunch of fluff that you don't need. Remember, I'm proud of you. Remember, you need to take breaks. Remember to do self-care. If you are not taking care of you, everything around you is going to fall. Everything. So you have to take time for yourself. Come back, do a couple more slides, go away. We got a couple of days to do this. Today is Wednesday morning. First thing, it is now 7.51. And you guys have an opportunity to do very well in this exam. Like I said, my first exam, my average is usually in the 86 range, right? That's the average of everybody. Um, there's going to be one or two of you that are going to bomb it because you're not going to take what I'm saying to heart and you are going to freak out because you have test anxiety. I'm here to tell you that the reason I'm in your class, teaching your class, is because we all figured out, uh, mainly the dean, um, the dean said, hey, listen, I want to stick you in this class because you're really good about knocking a whole bunch of bad habits out of people. Um, and you motivate people to get rid of those bad habits and test anxiety is a huge habit that we have all the way up until the end and it is wrecking people and I said please let me have them that early I would love to have them that early so that I can knock it out of them and then they could just walk around like gospel because they know their stuff and they're confident in their ability and here we are so it starts today it starts now Friday is going to be a good day tomorrow we're going to have a zoom all right so don't freak out about it and we're going to go over everything again and I'm going to give you opportunity to talk about it. And we're going to have an open forum where we all have open discussion and it's going to go great. Okay. I know this because I've done it consecutively over and over and over and over with nothing but success. Okay. This is a lot of information. Pay attention to it. All right. I'm going to go because I have a hair appointment because I'm going to do my self care and I'm excited. And I got seven minutes to go throw some clothes on and jump down the road. So I love you all. I'm proud of you all. Stay safe. Pay attention, give yourself breaks, give yourself grace, and I will talk to you tomorrow and I will see you on Friday and it's all going to be okay. All right. Bye guys.